The preseason's over, ladies and gentlemen, and we've had players of falling down in fantasy football drafts, as well as losing overall trade value over the past few months that I want to go through and highlight as potential buy low candidates, regardless of if you're going to get them at a discount in your fantasy football draft, or potentially if you want to go through and try to trade for one of these guys before the season starts. Now, first guy, you should have already bought low on, but I do have to give y'all an update with Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs is back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, y'all know I'm extremely biased. This was our most drafted player in fantasy football last season, and I've been scooping him up nonstop in the third round of underdog drafts over the past month. This is a running back that was the running back three from a points per game perspective last year, and I already know y'all are going to go down to the comment section and say, well, Mason, I heard that you can't take running backs coming off a massive workload. They're more likely to get injured. They're more likely to bust. It's a lie. I have no idea who the hell told y'all that. I don't know why y'all are saying that in my comment section, but we did the research, and if you go through the years 2000 to 2022 running backs to have over 300 carries and 50 receptions in a season that were 26 year old or younger their following season over 50 percent of the time they were a top six running back in fantasy football hell 70 percent of the time they were a top 12 rb if you're looking at top 24 90 percent of the time they were so the floor for josh jacobs essentially is a top 24 running back the more likely scenario is he is a top six running back in fantasy football. He has to move from the third round right now in underdog drafts up to the first and second round turn. I'm telling you right now, he's not going to move that high. So I will go through and I'll continue to draft the hell out of him. And if we are going to be looking at where he moves in your regular redraft formats, I think you have to be looking at him next to Saquon Barkley and Nick Chubb as well. Now, going over to our next guy, this is someone that I've been drafting nonstop since he's fallen to the seventh round of underdog drafts over the past month. With Kyle Pitts, people are worried because he was horrendous last season. And yeah, he scored almost nothing in terms of actually making a difference in your fantasy football lineup in 2022. If anything, he hurt you because you were starting him, or at least I was starting him nonstop through the first eight weeks thinking he was going to turn it around, and he never did. Now, I do want to take a step back with Kyle Pitts because I'm telling you to draft him as a top 10 tight end this next season, despite the fact that he was only the tight end 22 from a points per game perspective last season. But we have to give some context to this, right? And I want to take a step back, look at who Kyle Pitts was as a prospect. And uh, the simple answer to that was he is the best tight end prospect of all time. You literally can't find an argument. I mean, please go through and try to find a tight end that was a better prospect than Kyle Pitts. He was an elite athlete. He had the size you wanted to see. He had the production profile you wanted to see. And he was the highest drafted tight end in NFL history. The best tight end prospect of all time. Then you go to his rookie season at 21 years old when you assume that nobody's going to produce at 21 years old as a tight end. And Kyle Pitts had the best rookie tight end season of all time. If you're looking at pass catchers since the year 2000, the only players that had more receiving yards on a per game basis at 21 years old in Kyle Pitts were Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Juju Smith-Schuster, Keenan Allen, Mike Evans, and Amari Cooper. So only elite level wide receivers. Now you're going to say, well, Mason, last year was horrendous. Come on, man. What the hell are we talking about? And on the surface, it was, but it was not his fault because the underlying metrics show that Kyle Pitts actually continued to improve with this overall usage. He went from a 19% team target share in 2021 to a 24% team target share in 2022. Now, the reason the fantasy points weren't there is because this was the second worst passing offense we've seen in the NFL since 2012. The only worst passing offense we've seen in the NFL over the past decade were the Chicago Bears last season. Now, of course, the Atlanta Falcons are still going to be a bad passing offense this next season. It's going to be a team that looks to run the ball over and over and over again. And for that reason, we can't come out here and say Kyle Pitts is a top three tight end. I'm not going to tell you that at all. But what I can say is, okay, well, if you look at where he is getting drafted, he's the best pick and it's not even close. And I'm sorry to say this. I know that nothing's ever black and white. But the wide receivers that are drafted after Kyle Pitts in underdog drafts include Zay Flowers, Quentin Johnston, Brandon Cooks, Elijah Moore, and Cortland Sutton. Kyle Pitts will outscore every single one of these wide receivers. Hell, if we go through and look at Kyle Pitts in his season-long pick'em line on underdog, 
Right now, they have him at four and a half receiving touchdowns. And I know that's one thing that people are worried about saying, oh, Kyle Pitts doesn't score touchdowns. Touchdowns are extremely volatile. Red zone usage is going to be wildly, wildly changing from a year to year perspective. And if you're going to tell me that Kyle Pitts can't score touchdowns, I'm going to point you to his final season at Florida where the man averaged 1.5 touchdowns per game. But nonetheless, four and a half touchdowns, 700 receiving yards and 52 and a half receptions. I can't tell you if Flowers is going to get that this next year. I can't tell you if Quentin Johnson is going to get that next year. And if you're getting Kyle Pitts in this type of production as a tight end, I'm all about it. Now, our next guy is going to be another tight end that I like in this range, simply because I think in round seven of underdog drafts, these tight ends here outscore the wide receivers straight up. Dallas Goddard last year was the tight end five from a points per game perspective. Now I understand he gets injured at the end of the season. And yes, that does cloud the judgment, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, Dallas Goddard has continued to improve every single year of his NFL career. You go back to 2018 as a rookie. He was sitting there at 20.9 receiving yards per game. The following season, 40. The year after, 47. The year after, 55. Last year, 58. So Dallas Goddard has continued to improve every single season of his NFL career. This is an elite level offense. This is a tight end that's healthy going into this next year. He's going into his age 28 season. We know tight ends don't peak till later on in their NFL careers. And like we were discussing, if you're looking at him next to where he's going in these drafts, if you're looking at him freaking next to Zay Flowers, Quentin Johnston, the tight ends will outscore the wide receivers here. There's no reason to be taking wide receivers in these range. And instead, please go get your tight end. Now, the one wide receiver I'd be fine taking in this range was one of the most overdrafted players in fantasy last year. We were making fun of people for taking Michael Pittman Jr. in round three of drafts last season. We were sitting here going, how the hell do you think that Michael Pittman Jr. is Julio Jones just because Matt Ryan is Indianapolis now? And we can safely say that Matt Ryan probably doesn't have it anymore based off his drop-off and efficiency, plus the Falcons gave him up for absolutely nothing. But keep in mind, I was also the idiot drafting Kyle Pitts in round three. So, I mean, it's not like I made a bunch of money passing on Pittman. But nonetheless, if you're going through and looking at Michael Pittman, he was actually better last year than I'd imagine. He went from the wide receiver 28 to the wide receiver 23 from a points per game perspective. He went up to averaging almost nine targets per game. Now, the efficiency drop was massive, right? I mean, Michael Pittman Jr. was not an efficient wide receiver last season. 1.5 yards per route run. But you know why? It's because he had some of the worst quarterback play in the entire NFL. If you're looking at an adjusted yards per pass temp standpoint, he dealt with the play of 37-year-old Matt Ryan, who is at 6.0. That's a bottom three quarterback in the NFL. But yeah, he didn't have to play with Matt Ryan the entire time. He got some action with Sam Ellinger, who is at 4.9 adjusted yards per pass temp, worse than the NFL. Unless you want to count a three-game sample of Nick Foles, where Nick Foles was maybe the worst quarterback of all time. In those three games, zero touchdowns, four interceptions, 1.0 adjusted yards per pass step. Legitimately, I don't know if I would have done worse than this. Now, I've never played quarterback, so I can't be sure, but I would imagine that you put me in that scenario I probably don't last one hit, but before I get hit and before I'm taken to the hospital, I bet I could average more than one adjusted yards per pass in, in that Indianapolis Colts offense. Now, with Michael Pittman Jr., the quarterback play will most likely not be great this next season either, right? I mean, you have Anthony Richardson, and while maybe I like Anthony Richardson from a fantasy football perspective, that's because his rushing upside. I'm not sitting here thinking that Anthony Richardson is going to be some great real-life NFL quarterback immediately, right? The passing volume still probably is not going to be here. But in reality, can it be worse than what Michael Pittman Jr. had last season? Probably not. He doesn't really have any added target competition. He was the wide receiver 23 from a points per game perspective last year. Now you're getting him as the wide receiver 39. Yeah, last year, he was a horrendous pick. But this season, I'm actually kind of all about him. Now, as we go over to our next guys, I will say you're primarily going to be interested in Bryce Young and CJ Stroud in underdog best ball drafts. Obviously, if you draft like Bryce Young as your quarterback three in your underdog draft, and he turns out to be like a top 15 quarterback in fantasy, that's a massive hit and you could win a lot of money. 
However, in your regular redraft format, right, these quarterbacks aren't really ever going to move the needle because even if you draft Bryce Young as like the quarterback 28 and he turns out to be the quarterback 15 in your regular ESPN draft, that's still never going to make a difference for you. But that's one of the reasons I like underdog because we can talk about these deeper guys. And of course, real quick, if y'all want to get into an underdog draft with us, you know, I'm still streaming drafts every single night. Their best ball drafts to no time commitment at all during the season. So I drafted 700 teams to win $150,000 last year and if you want to drive with us you can find that link in the comment section in the description or the live chat and if you use promo code flock they're going to match your first deposit dollar for dollar up to 100 plus you'll get our 2023 fantasy football rankings get a free trial to flockfantasy.com where you can find our 2023 fantasy football draft guide and on top of that i got Everybody that uses promo code FLOCK, an exclusive Josh Allen pick -em. More than less than half a passing yard against the Jets week one. So please make sure y'all are taking advantage of that. But going over to Bryce Young and CJ Stroud, both these guys have fallen a couple rounds in ADP. I don't necessarily want to talk about if they're great picks, if they're guys that we want to be avoiding. More so from an overall strategy perspective on what we should be doing going forward in these best ball drafts. And this is something that we talked about earlier on this offseason as well. Whenever you're in those underdog drafts and whenever we're just in the dead of summer, right? Everybody's going to be sitting here and looking at those guys that are brand new coming into the NFL, all the rookies, and they're going to get super pumped. I mean, these are the guys that everybody wants to talk about, and they're not really going to be realistic with the expectations. But as we get closer to NFL kickoff, when people begin to realize, oh yeah, these rookie quarterbacks probably aren't going to do much year one. And that's our very reasonable expectation to have. Then naturally the excitement dies off. These veterans that people begin to project out and see that they have higher median projections than the rookies will move up draft boards while these rookies tend to move down. So I just kind of want to highlight this in saying if you are in underdog drafts, now it is a much better time to be drafting both Bryce Young and CJ Stroud now that they have dropped a few rounds in comparison to where you're having to draft them over the offseason. Now, two other guys that are going to kind of sit now, two other guys that kind of fit the same mold are going to be these players that are not playing at the beginning of the season, right? Whenever it's June, whenever it's July, it's easy for people to think about the long term. It's easy to think about weeks 12, 13, 14, 15. But once we get to the beginning of September, people are more so going to be thinking about weeks one, two, and three and what that means for their fantasy football teams. So we have seen both Jamison Williams as well as Kyler Murray fall a tremendous amount in fantasy football drafts overall. And I am fine with you drafting these guys under two circumstances. And we've talked about this all offseason. One, if you're in your regular redraft format, there is no reason for you to ever take Jamison Williams or ever take Kyler Murray unless you can put them on the IR. If they have to be a dead roster spot on your bench, prohibiting you from making waiver wire moves through the first six weeks, it is going to cause more harm to your team than it will good, and you should not waste a roster spot on these players. But if you can draft them, then put them on the IR where you're not having to waste that roster spot on them early on in the season when they're not playing. And then instead, when they are coming back, we can go ahead and we can bring them to the team for the overall upside they have in the second half of the season. Then that's a good spot to draft them. And the other spot I would look to draft them if it is an underdog tournament, right? Where it's like a $25 buy-in, $3 million first place prize. And we are trying to optimize for weeks 15, 16, 17 for the overall fantasy football playoff tournament where that's when the real money is made. Then I'm fine with you drafting them in that instance as well. It's kind of similar to how in some of those big underdog tournaments last year, I drafted Deshaun Watson at the very end of drafts, just saying, okay, well, if he isn't suspended the entire season and we get him for the last few months of the year and he is able to be a top three quarterback in the second half, then we could win a crap ton of money. Obviously, it didn't work out that way, but kind of the same thought process here. Just please make sure you're not wasting garage spot in your regular redraft league unless you can put him on the IR. Now, going over to our next guy, we will be looking at Devin Singletary. And with Singletary, I have been surprised to see how much he's falling down these draft boards. I mean, I've noticed he's fallen about two to three rounds in every single draft that I've been in in comparison to where his ADP used to be. And I thought there was something that I was missing. I was sitting here going, okay, did Devin Singletary get hurt? Did Houston sign another backup running back? What's going on? And in reality, that didn't happen. In reality, people just finally realized that Devin Singletary is not the starting running back for the Houston Texans. 
that he is not going to be taking 50% of this backfield from Damian Pierce, that should have been the obvious. I mean, we looked at the contract earlier this offseason. We looked at the actions taken by the Houston Texans and how Damian Pierce played year one. We said, yeah, Damian Pierce, the clear-cut starter. Devin Singletary is the clear-cut backup. You can draft him as a handcuff if you really want him. But don't think that he is a starting running back by any means. And now that it looks like people have begun to realize that, they begin to price Devin Singletary appropriately. And I will now take him at the very end of underdog best ball drafts. In your shallow redraft league, though, I mean, there are just other running backs that have more handcuff appeal than Devin Singletary. Now, one player that's been falling that I don't want to go out there and say, okay, get him now, get him now, get him now. But I do want to put him on our watch list and to monitor how far this fall continues is going to be Hollywood Brown. Now, there are a couple different reasons why Hollywood's fallen as much as he's had over the past month or so. One, it looks like the Arizona Cardinals may be in full-blown tank mode. I mean, they were trading away everybody for just six, seventh round picks. We already saw the actions taken by them in the NFL draft, really setting themselves up for 2020 and for beyond. And in that instance, we don't even know if Kyler Murray's guaranteed to come back this next season. I mean, if all of a sudden the Arizona Cardinals are in a spot where, I mean, they are one in eight, Kyler Murray is clear to play. Do you throw Kyler out there? Do you have any incentive to do that? Or would you rather say, okay, yeah, Kyler, man, um, we are going to make sure that you are healthy. That way we can lock up the 101 in the 2024 draft. And if we decide to, we can draft Caleb Williams. If we decide to, we can trade the pick for a haul similar to the Chicago Bears and surround you with all the talent in the world next year. So that is one concern that you have with Hollywood. The other concern is there are just, I mean, clips coming out of training camp where the man just doesn't look good overall. Now, I'm not saying to go buy low on Hollywood. I do think that it's interesting to put him on your watch list, though, just because there's literally nobody else to throw the ball to in Arizona right now. And if you look at how far he's fallen, right now he is about to fall behind Gabe Davis, Jordan Addison in ADP, going as a wide receiver four in drafts. And once he is a mid-wide receiver for like Michael Pittman Jr., then at that point, I will be in on Hollywood Brown. But I think that's all I have for you. Again, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for checking out this video. If you have not done so already, please go down there, drop a like, subscribe to the channel if you play fantasy football. And if you want to get in a draft with us, whether that's tonight, tomorrow, the next day, you get a final link to Underdog Fantasy in the description or the comment section. Promo code FLOX is going to get you a 100% deposit match up to $100, plus our 2023 fantasy football rankings, a free trial to FLOCKFANTASY.com where you can find our 2023 fantasy football draft guide. It's best balls to no time commitment at all during the year. So I drafted 700 teams won $150,000 last season. And also, Underdog is where I got you all set up with a Josh Allen special only for people who use promo code flock against the Jets week one more than less than half a passing yard so please take advantage of that but thank you again ladies and gentlemen I really do appreciate you and I really hope I get to draft with you in a live stream later tonight